But according to Home Office figures, asylum backlog figures have now hit a record high, with a total of over 175,000 people awaiting approval in the first stage of their application in June of 2023. Figures also revealed a 63% increase of people coming on work visas in the year to June 2023, whilst the Migrant Observatory claimed only 41% of the total asylum seeker applicants travelled via those small boats. Well, joining me to discuss this is the former Brexit Party MEP, Ben Habib, and the co-founder of Novara Media, Aaron Bastani. Thank you to you both. Aaron, I'll start with you. I mean, are you of the view that actually the Labour Party are the ones with the right response here? And what we should be doing is opening up new legal routes so, you know, we don't get people coming over on small boats, maybe, or actually maybe that'll be a way to speed up the application process. I think particularly in regard to Afghan nationals, you probably need to create some kind of bespoke means of, of um, trying to get here legally, yes. Partly because we owe a great many people over there something of an obligation. You know, they were translators. They were working on the behalf of the various occupying forces there, and they've sort of been left behind. But other than Afghans, you know, I think that's an open question. On the, on the big takeaway here, on these numbers, which are astronomical, Darren, they're extraordinary. We've never had this before. What I want to put to you and your viewers today is I think a lot of this is on purpose. I think it suits the Conservative Party to have an utterly dysfunctional immigration system, particularly on asylum, because it allows the issue to stay very high up the policy agenda, the political agenda, quite right too. And particularly on the small boats, it lets them off the hook when it comes to extraordinary levels of, quote, legal migration. So with regards to people seeking asylum in this country, it's broadly the same as it is in France. Now, you might think it's too high, but there's a, there's a comparison there elsewhere in Europe of a similar sized country on legal migration. We're far, far higher. So I think what we're seeing now, Darren, is actually by design by the Conservative mm. Party. It's coming unstuck because, of course, Rishi famously said, judge me on the small boats, judge me by uh, overcoming this challenge. And he's failed. Ben Habib, then, come on, I want to hear from you, because what do, I, I'm looking at my emails here, flooding up. What do people who actually have been voting time and again for probably as long as I've been on this planet, Ben, what do they do? To, who do they vote for? Who do they back if they actually want to reduce immigration to this country? Because it seems that our democratic demand, we voted, after all, to take back control, are being ignored time and again. Well, I know precisely who they should vote for if they want to take back control of our borders, and it's Reform UK. You know, we're the only that. party, <laughs> we're the only party that would actually do the right thing, which is uh, exercise border control, stop the boats in the channel, and send them back to France, which is our absolute international legal entitlement under UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, Article 33. It's an entitlement which our government has completely ignored. Um, and if you want to cut back the asylum seeker applications, and you want to get control of that particular domestic problem, the easiest way to do it is to stop people illegally entering the country in the first place. So absolutely, we've got to develop the political will and courage to stop the boats before they enter our territorial waters or as they enter our territorial waters, send them back to France. But I thought it was a really interesting point Aaron made that this could be some kind of willful move from the Conservative Party to mask their complete lack of control over legal migration, which, as we know, has gone through the yeah. roof. Having said that we would introduce a point-based skill system and only take into the country those people that we needed for specialist skills that could actually benefit the economy, what the Conservatives have done, as Aaron rightly pointed out, is throw the doors open completely. What the Conservative government has done in effect is turn its back on British, the British worker, ignoring the fact that 6.2 million people now, that's twice as many as before lockdown, and six times as many as in 2018, are now on some form of universal credit. They just turned their back on the broken labour market and thought, well, how are we going to fill the jobs? We'll just open the floodgates. And you know, you cease to be, fundamentally, Darren, you cease to be a country if your borders aren't exercised, both in a legal fashion, as well as those who are trying to enter the country illegally. 
And well, oh. I mean, it's an interesting thesis from Aaron. Yes. I suspect one of the reasons, by the way, that Rishi Sunak is delaying the reshuffle, which um, John Rental uh, didn't mention, was he's waiting, I think, for the optimum moment when he can blame Suella Braverman for all of this. Mm. And um, that moment may not yet have uh, you know, got, uh, arisen. Uh, well, Aaron, I assume you'll be dashing out to, to back Reform UK after all of that. I'm sure that's not a word that you disagreed <laughs> with. Well, you know, um, I would I would not vote Conservative or Reform UK, but I have to I have to admit, ben, somebody like Ben Habib is infinitely more eloquent and intelligent, and I'm not just you know buttering you up, Ben, because you're here, than the rank and file of the Conservative Party in the House of Commons. You know, we have a very low talent, uh, low effort a political class in this country, and I think that's an outgrowth of the two party system. That's why I'd like to change our electoral system and have electoral reform. Uh, on 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 the point about legal migration too, this is really important. Britain has had a bust economic model since 2008. We have not had the kind of growth that we've been accustomed to or that, frankly, we need to have. Now, one way of overcoming that, of course, is to have massive numbers of people entering the country. So what that means is you've got stagnant productivity. The amount of output per person is staying the same, which is broadly what's happened. But of course, because you have more people in the country, you can point to the GDP stats and say, look, our economy is growing. Well, of course, it's growing when you've got 600,000 net immigration in a single year. That's inevitable. So I think a big part, again, Ben talked about, you know, trying to fill shortages in the labor market with legal migration. That's part of it. I also think, frankly, the conservative mindset here and also the Treasury, which goes, you know, it's also an, an issue with regards to the civil service. The mindset here is, well, look, we can't have multiple years of economic recession or zero growth. So to massage that somewhat, we need to really you know, have a much more generous um, immigration policy with regards to legal migration. So I, I think it's PR, I think it's marketing, and I think it's the consequence, really, of 15 years of the political class having no idea about how to grow the economy in a sustainable, meaningful way. Well, you know what? I, I find myself agreeing with Aaron Bastani more and more, and that's quite troubling. But Ben Habib... So do uh, I. So do I. I. So do I. <laughs> one of our viewers, Ben, has, has written in, in Yvonne, she's called Yvonne, and she says it's a disaster. I've always voted Tory. I'm sick to death of incompetent Tories. Now, what would you do, Ben, if you were Prime Minister tomorrow, for example? You, you know, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, he has a year to sort this out before he goes to the polls. Is there anything that could be done to bring this to an end within 12 months? I think there's a huge amount that can be done. First of all, you've got to make fundamentally make it pay to work. So you've got to lower the tax burden on those who are earning the least in the country. And reform, you, we talked about Reform UK. One of our policies is to get rid of any tax up to £20,000 per year so that it genuinely does pay to work. That's the first step. The second step is to take the burden of costs off the consumer. You know, the, the drive, this relentless drive to net zero, I don't want to get into a debate over the climate, whether the, you know, the world's about to burn up or not, but the method by which we're going about to deliver the net zero agenda is a deeply economically damaging agenda. And it's putting a huge cost burden on the populace. And we've got to remove that. We've got to have joined up energy policy. So lower taxes on the working, on the working class, a proper energy policy, deregulate across the, across the board. We're a highly regulated country. We need people to be able to go out, unfettered small businesses, go out and grow. We need disruptive businesses. We don't want to fill um, uh, the large corporates with cheap sources of labor. We want innovation in the economy. So we want to champion small and medium-sized enterprises. At the moment, all the government policies is aimed towards you know, aimed to supporting the large corporates. So there's a hell of a lot, Darren, that could and should be done in order to get the United Kingdom moving forward again. And I, and I suspect Aaron and I agree on a lot of that too. Yeah, so Aaron then, I mean, the migration nation is the strap there we've got at the bottom. And a lot of people are feeling that there's a real problem with democracy. There's a broken ballot box. People aren't being it listened is, to. Yeah. I mean, how worried are you about actual participation and, and voter apathy? Incredibly worried. I think it's a very dangerous thing. Um, and I think it's, it's dangerous because it creates a vacuum. And if you can't debate things in a meaningful way, and people think that actually, if there's a vote on something and a majority select a certain outcome, if that's not actioned on, people get disenchanted. And look, this process is very slow, just because, you know, uh, turnout in elections doesn't you know, collapse overnight. 
a process of democratic disenchantment can take years or decades. I frankly think we're, we're decades into it. I think really after 2000, things fell off a cliff. Um, that's pretty obvious. If you look at, for instance, electoral turnout by income, it was broadly flat, actually, really until the early, mid uh, early to mid-1990s. And then it really changed. You know, poorer people are less likely to vote. We think that's normal. It's not. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a, a, a big transformation here. And as I said a, a few moments ago, if you have two political parties, people call them the uni party, with little meaningful difference between them, who don't action the kinds of outcomes that the electorate ask for, then I think people start turning to, to frankly, more dangerous uh, political um, agents and more dangerous political solutions. So I think it's a very concerning thing. And I'll, I'll just finish with this. You know, people like John Rentoul, who just came on, he was kind enough to come on your show, so I'm not going to attack him personally when he can't defend himself. But people like John Rentoul will talk about the political centre. And for them, the political centre means PFI, outsourcing, uh, you know, your high street looks like crap, will favour the big corporates, like, you know, Ben Habib said, the CPI. They're not looking out for medium, small, small businesses in this country. They would say, well, well, that's not really our job. They talk to the big supermarkets and a few of the big corporates, and they think that's business. It's not. Uh, so for these people, the centre is listening to the supermarkets, PFI, outsourcing, and wearing a nice suit and having a £400 haircut. The real centre is very left-wing on the economy, and maybe Ben and I might not like that, uh, and it's more right on socially conservative issues. And, and I think, frankly, we need to have a discussion about how, on both sides of that debate, social majorities in this country are locked out from political representation. Yeah, Ben Habib, we haven't got very long, I'm afraid, but, uh, you know, briefly, yesterday we saw the exclusive by GB News showing that uh, British women were being shown on social media accounts to actually advertise for migrants to come here. Were you worried, dismayed by that? Well, I, I, I'm obviously dismayed and worried by it, but the real message, the real revelation of that is that this isn't genuine, ref this is not about refugees coming to the UK to escape war-torn countries. This is about people who are being marketed to to come to the UK for whatever nefarious reason it is they wish to come here. In this case, obviously, people who got designs on our beautiful young ladies. And um, it, 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 it's, we've got to see it for what it is. Just one stat I think we've really got to focus on in, when it comes to illegal migration. We spend £50,000 a year per head for those who went to the country illegally. The French spend £5,000 per head. Of course, they weren't going to want to come to the UK. Mm. And one more stat. Sorry, Darren. In total, we spent nearly four billion last year. That came out of the international aid development budget. Four billion on housing and looking after these illegal migrants. We talk about our obligation to Afghanistan. That could be much, much more effectively deployed in Pakistan, which has something like nearly four million Afghan refugees living in utter poverty because of the war in Afghanistan. If we can solve those co people coming to the country, if we can stop that, that four billion could be used so much more effectively to hit the problem, to address the problem that Aaron identified, which is this moral obligation we have to the war-torn country that is Afghanistan. OK, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately. That conversation could have definitely gone on. But Ben Habib there and the co-founder of Novara Media, Aaron Bistani, thank you very much.